Hello everybody, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 142. This week the questions are taken from the guide to HMS Queen Mary, that's guide 202, and the accompanying Wednesday video on HMS Illustrious and Operation Excess. Thomas Anderson asks, with remarks towards HMS Queen Mary, why would it matter if the officers' quarters were fore or aft? Traditionally, back in the age of sail, the officers' quarters were aft. Then, when it came to the age of steam and steel and iron, officers' quarters moved more amidships because it was suddenly found that whilst in a sailing vessel, being right aft was a relatively comfortable place to be in, in an early steam vessel, where you are now sitting right above the propellers, it was not the world's most comfortable place to be in. So that's how they ended up switching positions in the first place. Then you had further developments, mainly to do with the size of ships. If you look at the length of a something like even a first rate like HMS Victory, it doesn't really matter where you're sleeping. The ship, whilst substantial, is still small enough that if someone sounds the drums and you have to get beat to quarters, you can run the entire length of the ship in much, much less than a minute if you're halfway fit. So, therefore, I'm going to say where you are doesn't at the time doesn't make too many odds. But when you're talking about a ship like a battle cruiser or something that's hundreds and hundreds of feet long and has multiple decks, lots of different passageways, quite often no direct path to any particular location, now the where you are does make an awful lot of difference. And of course you've got people potentially going in all sorts of other directions trying to reach their action stations. So now, because distance is much more important, it's now actually better to relocate the officers aft again, because if all your crew quarters are aft, well, the vast majority of your action stations are forward amidships anywhere but aft. I mean, there's not many people who have an action station in the secondary steering position or similar. So if the officers are quartered amidships in the forward superstructure, well, then they can when action stations are sounded, they can head up to the bridge and great, um, and a few of the other action stations they're at. But the rest of the crew are now left having to flood forward through the ship, which is going to take time, going to lead to confusion, etc., etc. Um, whereas if the crew are mostly quartered roughly in the middle of the ship, or just forward, they're basically sitting in the middle of the areas that they need to actually man, which means that when you sound action stations, they can get to their stations much faster, much easier. And as I said, with the time scales on a ship that size, that does actually make quite a bit of difference. Now, yes, the officers being more aft means that they are the ones who are now having to do the whole move forward through the ship to get to their stations, but one of the critical differences is that if you need to, say, man the guns, you need a full gun crew if you're going to do it efficiently. Whereas in terms of the officers, there will be an officer or there should be an officer on duty on all the important stations at any given time. So having additional officers there is good, but not necessary to actually get the ship into action. So for example, if let's say the admiral if you've got an admiral aboard or possibly the captain as well are sleeping and the ship's called into action well the first officer at least should already be on the bridge the first officer is competent enough to get the ship ready to co for combat if it takes a few minutes for the captain or the admiral or both to show up that's not going to manifestly change the ship's ability to get ready for a fight whereas if you're you're doing the same thing and it takes you five or six minutes for your forward gun crew to get into place fully and and get the gun slewed around and trained and everything that is something more of an issue and so this is why there was this um experiment and eventually the reversion to yeah actually the officers quarters are better aft and the crew are better amidships there are a bunch of other reasons as well, everything ranging from the officers not liking the men looking in on their quarters amidships when they're eating, uh, which is relatively mundane, 
all the way through to other issues about capacity, but those are secondary to the efficiency of the ship. Fabian Zimmerman asks, During the Battle of Tsushima, when the Japanese fleet was crossing the T of the Russian fleet, Admiral Rutsetsvensky decided to turn to starboard, going a parallel course to the Japanese fleet. Is there a reason that he didn't turn to port? In my opinion, this manoeuvre would have gotten him away from the Japanese fleet, and considering he didn't particularly want to fight that battle, I'm surprised he didn't do that, and would like to know why. Was it a poor strategic decision? Was something preventing him from doing it? Or was it something else? There's a number of factors in play, one of which, if you remember, is that the Russians had just tried to change formation and were changing back into line, so the formation was a bit of a mess at the time that Togo began his crossing of the T. And that had demonstrated to Rostovsky, apart from anything else, that trying to do any kind of complex manoeuvring was probably not the best of ideas with the fleet he had at the time. Secondly, as you can see from this diagram, when Togo is crossing the Russian T at the start, he is transiting from starboard to port. So an initial port side turn by Rostovsky is actually going to bring him into closer range of the Japanese fleet, because that's the direction the Japanese fleet is going. Then the Japanese fleet doubles back, and that's when he makes his starboard turn to accept battle. There's, when it comes to the starboard turn, again, a couple of reasons why he does this. Firstly, at this point, turning to port is turning towards the Japanese battle line, so effectively re-enabling the Japanese to cross his T whereas turning to starboard makes it a broadside battle, which is not necessarily the best of things, but it is at least better than driving his ships headlong in and getting them shot to pieces on the way in, which, to a certain extent, he knew had already happened with some of his vessels in the, uh, in the first set of manoeuvres. Plus, once the Japanese fleet showed up, there was no real escaping them. Y you could try and pull some kind of fancy manoeuvre, um, let's say, at the when the Togo makes his turn across the head of the line, you could actually turn to starboard maybe then and try and cut behind the Japanese fleet. But the Russian fleet, through a combination of having sailed a tremendous distance and therefore having their ships somewhat fouled and having some older and less capable ships, doesn't have the speed to escape the Japanese. So even if he manages to conduct some kind of fancy manoeuvre that breaks contact for a while, Togo can chase him down. And Togo can keep chasing him down and keep choosing a position of advantage. And there's nothing Rostovsky can actually do about that. At which point, better, in at least obviously in his view, to try and take on the Japanese fleet and give them enough of a bloody nose to hopefully make them back off when his fleet is at least mostly intact, than kind of have a death of a thousand cuts where Togo turns up, cripples a couple of ships, somehow Rosasvetsky breaks away, Togo shows up again, cripples another few ships, etc, etc, until the entire Russian fleet is worn down, or they manage to get cornered in a position they can't escape from, except now their fleet is massively, massively reduced. So, yeah, if, if Rosasvensky had had maybe a two to three knot speed advantage over the Japanese fleet, then breaking to escape might well have been more on the cards. But, unfortunately, it wasn't, and so he couldn't and didn't. Alexander Hartman asks, What was your best literature or archive find that changed your view on things the most considerably? Um, I'd say long term... It, it's difficult to pinpoint any specific piece of literature. I mean, Shattered Sword, for quite a lot of people, including myself, really did put a nail in the coffin of the old trope of the Japanese packed flight decks at Midway. But that is, whilst a considerably interesting bit of information, it still doesn't like, alter the fact that, you know, that's what Midway was lost quite badly by the Japanese. So it, it's an important detail, but it doesn't change the overall view of the, the battle itself, which is say, obviously the Japanese lost. Um, but I'd say probably in aggregate, the two largest changes from my view as, say, a teenager 
or early adult get to the point where I am now has probably been a series of literature finds mostly talking about the Japanese and Italian navies. The Kriegsmarine, whilst obviously as you do more research you find out more about them, the Kriegsmarine I think has not shifted dramatically in the sort of where where I estimate and or, or put them overall in the history of naval warfare in World War Two. But as a as a kid and a teenager, I certainly did kind of buy into the whole the Italians were just a little bit rubbish idea. And also the kind of the Japanese were operating on a shoestring with inferior technology and missing most of the major components that made a modern navy, which are both I don't want to necessarily say classic, but both very common, what I call pop culture views of those two navies. And when I started gra sort of graduating from, you know, early teenage um, quote unquote research to actually seriously looking into it, looking for things like archives, well sourced books, etc., that go into more technical details that change from those positions to actually my current position which is the italians had some really nice technology some really fancy technology they actually had some very good very well motivated crews and what they really lacked was decent leadership for the most part um some issues with quality control obviously and a number of issues with very finicky technology um but otherwise had some very nice ships, very nice designs, very nice tech, and could have done an awful lot better with a few very minor changes that are nothing to do with the the core of what the Italian Navy was. So that's quite a dramatic shift there. And with the Japanese as well, the more and more, and I think this is an ongoing process for me, the more and more I learn about the Japanese Navy, and to a lesser extent the army, but obviously I'm more focused on the navy, the more and more it becomes clear that this classic underestimation of the Japanese, which to a certain extent almost seems to be a continuation of the pre-war underestimation of the Japanese, really, really actually hurts the, the field of study because the Japanese were an incredibly capable navy. Yes, they did have shortcomings and, and faults, uh, a, a general lack of radar to the same extent and technological capability of the Allies, for instance. But they had some really advanced stuff as well. They had some of the world's first amphibious assault ships. They had actually did have a certain level of, of competence and advancement in underway replenishment. That's how they got their fleet to Pearl Harbor, for instance. They didn't go there on a single tank. Um... And their night fighting gear, their low light gear, for example. And we could go on about that for quite a while. But effectively, yeah, the, the Japanese are an awful lot more capable than they're usually given credit for in pop culture. And as I've said before, that that's not that's not a mark against anyone else. You don't lose anything by acknowledging that. If if nothing else, you gain something because it means that when the US Navy primarily and later on and at the beginning as well the Allied navies were fighting the Japanese that means they were up against a much more serious component opponent which means their victory is much more hard won and actually means more than rolling over somebody who supposedly lacks most of the elements that make up a modern navy but to address your question a little bit more closely I think if I had to pinpoint any literature dash archive set of finds or reading that has changed my views the most on things it's probably been collectively reading after action reports because it's very easy when you're looking at things purely from a technical dash engineering perspective to go oh yeah well in i don't know april 1942 the u.s navy had these AA guns in these numbers on their ships and therefore they you can only expect their effectiveness to be this whereas in 1945 they have all the AA guns so obviously you'd expect them to be more effective especially considering they've replaced like the 1.1 inch with the 
20 mil and the 40 mil so and rinse and repeat across the various other navies but it's i think when reading the after action reports you get a sense of not just that the technology and the numbers of aa guns are improving but the 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 other human factors about training about control about the the best use the best kinds of coverage to be uh, done from various ships all that kind of fine detail um, which hopefully you've enjoyed in the various after action reports from enterprise during the guadalcanal campaign series that i think has helped me understand in a lot more detail how that path evolves through through world war ii for the u.s navy but also after action reports from the mediterranean um from the atlantic etc that show that actually it's a far more involved process than just we now have like half of the bofors factory output in 40 mil that um and therefore we shoot down more aircraft that there's far 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 more involved i mean after all it, it, when you think about it, it's actually fairly logical. When you think about how many 25 millimeter the Japanese covered a lot of their ships in, if it was just a matter of adding more AA guns, they should have had far more effective results. Outbound Flight Gaming asks, can you explain the Drea table or the Argo clock, as it's the first time I've heard these terms? So the Drea table and the Argo clock, they're both forms of fire control table for centralized director controlled firing i.e. they are the electromechanical, effectively early electromechanical computers, the heart of the calculations for the fire control system. So this is where you plug in all those things I was talking about in the fire control and plotting video. So your course, heading, speed, the enemy's anticipated or calculated course, heading and speed, distance, range finding data, wind, etc. And effectively then it will do all the calculations for you and hopefully spit out a result which you can then aim your guns on. So that's the very, very, very short form. However, um, as well as covering them in that video, at some point in the future I will have to probably go into a video just explaining them in and of themselves. They're incredibly complex bits of machinery. But in the interim, since there's no way I can cover it in a dry dot question answer in any detail, there is a wonderful website called the Dreadnought Project. Um, there's a link in the video description under the timestamp for this particular uh, question, and that will take you to their page on the Drea fire control table, and I'm sure from there you can find their page on the Argo clock as well. And that goes into an awful lot more detail as to what exactly these things were and what they did. Sean O'Neill asks, Why were A, B plus X layouts such as Iowa, Yamato, etc., becoming more common than A, B, plus X, Y layout, such as Bismarck or Vanguard. Is there any inherent advantage to either layout? Oh, <laughs> this is an argument that really can get people going. Um, but, I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages to either layout. So, the main advantages of the A, B, X layout which is normally accompanied with triple turret layouts. I mean, technically, obviously, Renown and Repulsor ABX as well. Um, and that refers to basically having A turret, B turret under Royal Navy um, naming configurations, i.e. a pair of turrets forward, one super firing over the other, and a single turret aft, whereas AB plus XY is two super firing um, turrets forward and two turrets aft also super firing. Anyway, um, so assuming we're talking about ships with triple turrets, Having an ABX layout with triple turrets allows you to get one additional gun, because you get nine guns, as opposed to eight in the four turret layout, in less space. Because whilst individually the triple turrets are larger, the if assuming you're using roughly the same kind of technology, um, and you're in the same kind of navy, obviously, the space lengthwise taken up by three triple turrets is less than what you'd be taking up with four twins because each although each twin is going to be somewhat smaller than the triple it's not a third smaller the abx layout also gives you six guns forward as opposed to four in the abxy layout 
It means one less magazine if you're doing individual magazines and shell rooms for each turret, which obviously means less chance of boom. And again, because the overall size of three triples is slightly less than the overall size of four twins, you can actually afford to armor triples slightly more for the same weight than you can with twins. It's basically the, the square cube law again, increasing linear dimensions by, a, by so let's say, doubling them. Obviously, you're not doing that for that, but you double linear dimension. You've increased surface area by a uh, square or a factor of four, but you've increased internal volume by cube, a factor of eight. So you get a lot more internal volume and therefore space for guns, etc. Um, on mi relatively minimal increases in dimensions, which in turn means relatively minimal increase in dimension means relatively minimal increase in weight for additional armor. The disadvantages of the ABX layout are that you have one less gun firing aft, so you've got slightly less capability for an aft engagement. If you lose that aft turret, you've completely lost any ability to fire aft as opposed to uh, ABX while you still have another gun turret there. Additionally, with both, if you lose a turret, you're down to six guns, which is not brilliant. Um, but with the ABXY, then in theory, if you lose two turrets, you still have four guns, you still have half your armament, so you're only losing 25% of your armament at any given time, whereas with ABX, you are losing a third of your armament at any given time. So if you lose two turrets on an ABX layout, you're down to just three guns. Um, and at that point, you are going to be down to either fore or aft firing. Whereas technically, with ABXY, you could lose two turrets and still have some ability to fire both fore and aft. Obviously, it depends which turrets you actually lose. But the other thing is relative to size of ship, the triple turret is still wider so if your beam is a considerable issue, you can get twin turrets on a ship that you maybe can't get triple turrets on. Uh, it, although as ships begin to grow towards treaty era kind of limited ships, that becomes less of an issue. That's more of an issue in the run up to World War One when ships are a bit smaller. The other advantage of the ABXY is when it comes to ranging, if you're using half salvos, with an EBXY layout, you can fire two turrets, give yourself four shots, decent salvo, and then you can fire your other two turrets for another four shots and a decent salvo. Or you could fire one gun from each turret or whatever. With ABX, using triples, although you have one more gun, it means you're left in this slightly odd position of either firing three shots from a triple turret and then another three and then another three, but as we've discussed before, three is not really quite enough. Or you fire a four-shot salvo and a five-shot salvo, or the other way around, but you're splitting the fire of one of your gun turrets, which can make things a little bit clunky and difficult, because it means when you eventually find the range, that gun turret is almost certainly going to be part way through reloading one way or another. So there's advantages and advantages and disadvantages to each, Overall, it was judged the advantages of the triple uh, ABX layout outweighed the disadvantages of of that same layout. Um, but of course, then you've got things like the Montana that were going to go to ABX while using triples anyway um, later on. So there's an awful lot more discussion about it, but hopefully that's a good precy of some of the main advantages and disadvantages. Field Marshal Baltimore asks... Could or have naval torpedo bombers ever been used to bomb docks or buildings directly? Yes, they could. They were and they did. So even at Taranto, there were a few swordfish that were equipped with bombs in order to go after infrastructure and such like. And here you can see an Avenger being loaded up with bombs. Generally speaking, the earlier grades of torpedo bomber, at least the ones that were designed as dedicated torpedo bombers, had a somewhat limited bombing capacity because although a torpedo weighs quite a bit and therefore the lift capacity of a torpedo bomber was relatively substantial for its size the mountings for a torpedo and the mountings for a bomb are very different and obviously 
a single torpedo is mounted in a single location, which would mean that even if you did load it with a bomb, you might only be able to load one or two heavy bombs. But as time went on and aircraft got more capable and there was more reserve weight to put additional mountings in so you could switch between the two much more easily, you would begin to see more bombs being carried. And therefore, so you get to things like the Barracuda or the Avenger, and they're quite happy switching roles between torpedo bombing and, you know, regular bombing. Whereas something like a swordfish, whilst it could do bombing, as Taranto showed, it was nowhere near as useful in that role as it was as a torpedo bomber. And so, yeah, docks, buildings, etc., perfectly viable targets but more so towards the latter part of the war than the earlier part. All, although with the exception that the uh, Japanese B-5N did tend to do bombing pretty much almost as commonly as it did torpedoing, albeit, again, it wasn't quite as good in that role generally as compared to a more dedicated bomber. There's something like the B-6N, etc., or whatever the Japanese were calling it, like the Avenger and Barracuda, being a slightly later aircraft, more powerful, was better in that role. Hypertron DE asks, I've read that Germany had to hand over the Helgoland and Nassau classes as compensation for the scuttled ships and scapper flow. Could Germany have kept these old dreadnoughts if the other ships were not scuttled? To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not as au fait with the intricacies of the Paris Peace Conference and the negotiations that went on therein as I'd like to be. Um, obviously, I know the outcome of the Treaty of Versailles, at least on the naval side, relatively well. But I have to confess, the process of how they got from the start of the negotiations to the treaty is a little bit opaque to me. Um Given that, obviously, the final treaty is influenced by the fact that the Germans have scuttled pretty much the entirety of their modern fleet, and these are the only ships they've got left, as far as dreadnoughts are concerned, I can potentially see a case where they might be allowed to keep them. Probably not all of them, because the uh, Treaty of Versailles said they could have six pre-dreadnoughts, um... And obviously the Helgolands and Nassau's are more capable than that, and they're bigger than that, they're heavier than that. And I don't know how much, if anything, the scuttling of the fleet changed the attitudes of the various officers and politicians who were negotiating the treaty. So, potentially, I can see them agreeing to maybe retaining one class. There's four ships, so I keep four dreadnoughts instead of six pre-dreadnoughts because at this stage of proceedings four Nassau's which most likely would be the ones they'd be allowed to keep or even four Helgolands aren't a threat then they're, they're no more a threat than the six pre-dreadnoughts are to the big naval powers with you know Colorado's under construction Queen Elizabeth's and Revenge's in service etc so it could happen but that's just based on, I say, a very shallow understanding of, on my part, of the Paris Peace Conference itself. So, if anyone has read extensively into the Paris Peace Conference and maybe knows that actually pre dreadnoughts were going to be on the table as the only ships they could keep from the beginning, or maybe attitudes did change quite significantly after the scuttling of the fleet in Scapa Flow, please let us know in the comments below because I'd like to know as much as anyone else. Craig Hagenbruch asks how did the tactic of combat air patrol come about and what such events either in world war one or world war two or between the wars occurred that caused the idea and later the refining of it combat air patrol or cap evolved in the latter part of the interwar period along with the developing uh use of carriers the reason for that is that well having a flight of fighters or more orbiting your aircraft carrier or fleet is quite expensive in fuel and can't necessarily always be done it's relatively hard wearing on the aircraft so it's not something you by default would want to do however 
what had happened was that during the interwar period, 1920s going into the early 1930s, the speed and altitude capabilities of strike aircraft had advanced quite considerably. Back in the early 1920s, when carriers were first being developed, these aircraft were relatively slow, relatively speaking low flying, and that's why you'd see a lot of fighters being mounted on catapults on capital ships, for instance, not just because there weren't that many carrier hulls around, but because you could spot an incoming strike and legitimately, reasonably expect that you could get your pilot into your little catapult fighter, which obviously you're not going to get back most of the time, send him off and he'd have the time to climb to the altitude to intercept and hopefully break up the assault before it could get to you. But as aircraft became faster and higher flying, the time to intercept became a lot longer. Even though fighter uh, performance would also improve it in terms of uh, rate of climb, it was the speed more than anything that was the problem. So it, you now had this situation where an enemy airstrike could appear on the horizon uh, or possibly be reported by pickets slightly beyond your own horizon and they would be over you before any aircraft, whether they be catapult launched or on the deck of a carrier, could actually get up to altitude and intercept, which meant that you might as well not have those fighters. And so the solution was this combat air patrol idea where you would have a section of fighters during a wartime environment where you thought you might be at risk of attack, you'd have them orbiting. So when these strikes came in, they're already up there, they can move in to intercept, and that might then buy you the time to launch more fighters to help them. So that that's the core of combat air patrol. During the war... There were some attempts to go back to the old idea of having fighters ready to be warmed up, ready and warmed up on deck, but and ready to go, which, as I say, is a lot less taxing on them because radar came in, and this was certainly uh, more of a movement immediately pre-war. Post the actual wartime experience would disprove the idea fairly quickly, but the hope was that was with radar because you could spot the targets, the incoming targets, now further out than you could visually you could now have the time to warm up and launch fighters without the need for a combat air patrol. But as it turned out, the best solution for certainly World War II was to have combat air patrol up and use your radar to launch reinforcements so that those reinforcements could arrive either pretty much at the same time or shortly thereafter your combat air patrol had engaged. But it, the combat air patrol was still useful because it meant if you're starting from the same point, i.e. we've seen an incoming strike from some time away, if you're warming up and launching aircraft, it takes time to do that, takes time to get to altitude, so they can act as point defence for your fleet, yes, but only that. Whereas with combat air patrol, and combined with radar, you can send them out to intercept the strike before it gets to your fleet and hopefully then either break it up or disrupt it or whatever. And perhaps more critically, it then means that if the, the strike has been broken up or even has broken through, your anti-aircraft guns can then engage the enemy aircraft or what's left of them without having to worry about blowing your own fighters out of the sky at the same time. Although there were numerous carrier engagements in the war where the friendly fighters would stick to their job of continuing to gun down incoming strike aircraft regardless of the fact the fleet was also putting up an anti-air barrage and basically just hoping that the fleet's gunners knew who was who. BK Zhong asks a similar question. In World War II carrier operations, we see that combat air patrol is significantly more successful than anti-aircraft guns at defending against air attacks, even for late war American ships. So why is American anti-aircraft fire considered the main defence against Japanese air attacks in pop culture history? I think you're looking at a combination of three factors. One is what you might term the Dunkirk issue. So at the evacuation of Dunkirk, a lot of people on the ground were complaining, where is the Royal Air Force? Because they were being bombed and strafed by Luftwaffe aircraft on the beaches and on the evacuation ships. And they couldn't see much, if any, evidence that the RAF was doing anything. Now, as it turns out, the RAF was doing quite a bit. 
but what they were doing was intercepting incoming strikes over land, over France, before they could get to the beaches, which is obviously a much more sensible thing, because you break up or shoot down a strike before it gets anywhere close to the target, and it can't hurt the target. But because these combats were taking place away from the beaches, out of line of sight of the men on the beaches, you didn't see them, you didn't observe them, and so they thought the RAF wasn't there, even though they were. And similarly, if you've got a fleet with ships that have crews in the terms of several hundred men on a destroyer or a cruiser, over a thousand perhaps on a battleship or a carrier, and they're seeing enemy aircraft coming in and they're seeing them being engaged by the anti-aircraft gunners that's the thing that's going to stick in their mind comparatively speaking the number of pilots in the um, u.s navy or the royal navy is somewhat smaller so as a kind of a, a popular memory far more people who are veterans of those engagements are going to remember the anti-aircraft guns going off than they are going to remember, oh yeah, I was out 80, 90, 100 miles away from the ships and shooting down incoming bombers and a few of them got through. And let's face it, if you're a fighter pilot, you're probably going to remember some of the more exciting things more often, uh, operations over enemy airspace, attacks on enemy shipping, etc., more than you're going to remember air raid interception engagement number 67. Um, so that that kind of, I think, partly explains it. Partly, you've also got the fact that certainly early war, as we've seen with um, Santa Cruz and Eastern Solomon engagements in the Guadalcanal campaign, combat air patrol is only as good as your fighter direction, and the fighter direction was pretty poor early on. So just having a combat air patrol didn't necessarily mean that they would actually, you know, conduct the intercept or conduct it well and even though these techniques improved quite considerably towards the mid and later stages of the war then even so you're still going to get aircraft coming through unless it's a really really successful intercept and you can still make mistakes um, you, even with good fighter direction officers there can be errors there can be sneak attacks. The enemy gets a vote as well. They might send a, a wave of aircraft in and you send the combat air patrol to deal with them. And then it turns out actually another wave of aircraft's coming at a different angle. So again, the anti-aircraft guns are still going to be engaging. Even though the combat air patrol intercept itself might have been relatively successful. And then finally, there's the fact that the anti-aircraft guns are always there. There are weather conditions, whether that be hot, extremely high seas, extremely thick fog, night, extremely adverse winds, rain, etc., where flight conditions, flight ops might not be possible. So the combat air patrol might not be up, um, or might only be partially up. But whatever the flight conditions are the anti-aircraft guns are always there so if an enemy strike comes in during those conditions perhaps where an aircraft that's already aloft and flying into that weather can make it but it's not safe to take off or land from a carrier then in those engagements it's going to be just the anti-aircraft guns and so this constant presence of them combined with the other facts i talked about before will lead to an overall cultural perception i think that the anti-aircraft guns are the key thing. And in many cases, they are the key thing. Um, if you, I mean, if you look at the, the Guadalcanal campaign, the slaughter that the anti-aircraft guns inflicted on the, so some of the Japanese strikes is actually in excess of what the somewhat dodgy combat air patrols at the time were able to do. But then, on the other hand, some other attacks were massacred by the combat air patrol and there wasn't much left for the AA gunners. So swings and roundabouts... But I think that's generally why. that There's a certain basis to look at the AA guns as the ultimate main defence, as I said, because they're always there, and they're almost always going to have to be engaged. But that it does somewhat obscure the effectiveness of combat air patrols, especially towards the mid and later part of the war, as you say. <laughs> 
Ian Carr asks, according to the book Illustrious by Kenneth Pullman, the Taranto raid was apparently due to be repeated the following night, but was cancelled because of bad weather. Is this true, and what was planned? So yes, there was a follow-up strike planned. This would have involved about 15 aircraft, about 50-50 split between torpedoes and bombs, looking to finish off damaged ships and maybe hit ships that hadn't been damaged in the first wave, such as Vittorio Veneto, before the Italians could reinforce um, their defences, both in terms of torpedo nets, barrage balloons, anti-aircraft guns, etc. It was planned, it was called off, in large part because of poor weather. Um, how successful it would have been... It is kind of up in the air. On the one hand, you'd think the most obvious thing, it wouldn't be very successful because surely the Italians are now aware of what's going to happen uh, or what could happen and therefore will be at the ready. On the other hand, precisely because of that reason, very few people would imagine that someone would follow up with another raid. And Italian anti-air capabilities at night were still somewhat limited not entirely because they did shoot down a couple of swordfish in the first strike so it would have been very dicey kind of if the italians were just flat out waiting for them or if the italians concluded that no one could possibly be dumb enough to try an attack the, the following night and therefore actually more stood down trying to help the existing damaged ships um get into repairs and such like so it could have worked. It might have gone disastrously wrong. It might have gone incredibly well. Don't don't really know. Um, albeit there is one criticism of both the Taranto strike as it was and that follow-up wave, which I do agree with, which is that they probably should have just had a few flare-dropping swordfish and everyone else with torpedoes. The bomb load of a swordfish was not great and the bombing swordfish didn't accomplish all that much it would have been much better to just have more torpedoes to throw at the Italians. John Graubard asks, Four times the Japanese Navy won a naval battle around Guadalcanal, but did not press on to attack transports, beachhead or airfield. This seems quite different from the Japanese Army's fight to the last strategy. Why, and what result would have occurred if the Japanese Navy had, even suicidally, pressed ahead? Sometimes it was just down to lack of correct intel. Macau, for example, thought that Fletcher's carriers were still in the region. Sometimes it was down to a mixture of inter-service rivalry and poor communication. A number of times the Japanese army was absolutely certain that they either had or were about to capture Henderson Field and therefore blowing it up slipped somewhat down the Japanese Navy's priority list, understandably. That means... They, they didn't like the Japanese army, but they weren't about to launch full-on battleship bombardments off their own side just yet, anyway. Um, and sometimes it just appears to have been a mixture of nerves, shock, and confusion. Uh, for example, after the first night of the Battle of Guadalcanal, I can kind of understand poor old Admiral Abe having been effectively shot in the face. Um... <laughs> And probably at that point undergoing a severe concussion, not necessarily making the world's most uh, sort of most correct tactical decisions. Um, now, with that said, there are two primary scenarios in the various battles where, if the Japanese had pressed the attack, they could have changed not the course of the war but the course of that campaign. The, sec the well, the lesser of the two and the second of the two would have been the first night action of Guadalcanal. So he is already doomed at this point. But if Kirishima and the rest of the force had pressed on to bombard Henderson Field, that could have quite seriously set back the US campaign. I don't think it would have won the campaign in the Japanese's favour, but it would have certainly thrown a very big spanner in the works for a while. Now, the one that's probably of all the Guadalcanal battles, the one where you can point to the most and say this is where everything could have changed for the greatest part, is actually the first one, first battle of Savo Island. If Admiral Makawa had pressed on that night and 
bombarded the transports etc that could have really really messed up the allied effort on during the in the Guadalcanal campaign I mean there's a chance he might even have run into uh, Turner and Crutchley and their ships which would have added to the uh, losses that day or night but if they'd managed to take out the transports that could have been a real problem because that would have meant supplies um, down troops down valuable transports down lots of stuff lost plus possibly even shooting up the beaches etc and maybe even shooting up um, other parts of the island on their way back Fletcher of course isn't there and if they're able to suppress the what the beginnings of the Cactus Air Force, that's also going to help. At that point, the US Army forces and the Marines that are on Guadalcanal are going to have a shortage of supplies, not as many reinforcements, nothing's going to arrive for them anytime soon, and all their close naval support has just been swept away, which might, until at least Fletcher's carriers come, uh, come back, might give the Japanese even an opportunity for daylight fire support against you know, what's left of the US troops ashore. That could, if not in, have ended the entire campaign there and then, it could have at least driven the US back and left Henderson Field in Japanese hands, which obviously would not be a, a good thing for the US. So that could have had a massive, massive change on the course of events. Ryan Gale asks, could USS Atlanta have been repaired? Assume for a moment the crew was able to get the flooding under control and tow her to a more secure shallow area, similar to what was done with Portland. Considering the damage she sustained, she's obviously never going to make it back to Australia or Pearl Harbor on her own, but could repair materials have potentially been brought out to her that have gotten her seaworthy enough to get to one of those ports, or was she simply too severely damaged for anything short of a full shipyard dry docking? Well, if we're assuming that somehow the flooding has gotten under control, I still struggle to see it. The thing is, when you look at some of the other da ships that were heavily damaged in the area during various battles, Portland being an example, the ones that make it back, they're all much bigger than Atlanta. Portland, um, Minneapolis, New Orleans... Um, Pensacola, etc. They're all 10,000 ton cruisers. Atlanta just isn't. She's smaller, she's much more lightly built, and while San Francisco, you know, riddling her with 8 inch gunfire didn't help, the thing that really killed her was the long lance hit amidships. It killed pretty much all her power, it opened up a massive hole, there was an awful lot of flooding, and it was that that basically did the ship in eventually. So, yeah, without any power, if the flooding's been brought back under control, theoretically, you would probably tow her to Tulagi or um, out of the combat zone. But the bulkheads are going to be under such stress, and the hull structure, to be honest, given the size of the hole in the ship, is going to be under such stress. I don't think you could really get her any further than some of the immediate basic ports in the Solomon Island chain without her just coming apart at the seams or the bulkhead starting and the water flooding and the ship just sinking anyway. You could maybe bring a floating dry dock out to help patch the ship up, but no one in their right mind is going to risk one of the US Navy's valuable floating dry docks bringing it into the Solomon Island chain at that point in the campaign when Japanese aircraft and shipping and subs might well have a, a good go at it um, and I mean even even if you bring it into one of the Solomon Island chain ports that the US controls the best they can do is patch the damage maybe using logs to build a kind of breakwater but again I Maybe there's a very slight chance that if you effectively rebuild most of the missing centre section with just a mass of timber, you might be able to get it to maybe to Espiritu Santo or something where it might you might be able to pick it up with something a bit more substantial. 
but I really doubt it. I really, I do think that the damage to poor old Atlanta would have been enough to total her. She's just not big enough to absorb that kind of damage, I think. Jimmy the Fish asks, HMS Effingham versus Rock. Was it really as simple as the pencil line on the map? So according to a book by uh, St. Peter Smith with regards to Royal Navy shipwrecks, and also according to a letter in the Hydrographic Journal, the loss of HMS Effingham, which, for those of you who are not aware, uh, went aground during the Norwegian campaign and was subsequently lost, uh, was not quite as simple as just a minor course correction. It was to do with a narrow channel that the squadron was trying to navigate, trying to um, get in to deliver the troops and supplies that they had aboard for the Norwegian campaign. And they made a mistake, basically. They were trying to take a different approach to try and avoid air attack, and as part of that they went chose to go through down a relatively narrow channel that had rocks in it. The only map they had of the area was fairly large scale and so didn't include every single fine detail like, you know, rocks and shoals and such in a narrow shipping channel. And they went off down this channel on the basis of that, so that was a bit of a mistake. And that ended up with actually the lead ship, sensibly had being a destroyer, actually hitting the shoal first. But because it was a shallower draft and a glancing blow, it didn't fatally damage the destroyer. But then Effingham, following along shortly thereafter, managed to rip out enough of its the underside of its hull that it began to sink and proved unable to be beached. And so eventually it was had as much stuff as they could taken off of it, and then it was um, scuttled by its crew and nearby destroyers. So, yeah, they weren't at that point following a course that's down to we're tra tracking things on the, on a pencil line on a map. They were trying to thread the needle, as it were, and it just turned out that that particular um, needle eye that they were threading was not suitable for a heavy cruiser. Andrew Dederer asks, Did the German submarine force ever make a study about how to minimise their problems transiting to their hunting grounds, since in both wars the way out passed through either minefields or heavily patrolled zones such as the Bay of Biscay? British subs only face similar situations if they're based out of Malta, and the US ones only if they were targeting the Sea of Japan. Something like half the losses of Black May happened in the bay, which only occasionally would hold worthwhile targets like the Gibraltar convoys. Did they just ignore the march of technology, such as radar? There were a few different factors with regards to the Bay of Biscay. One of them simply is the fact that submarines at that point are not vessels that can stay underwater for extensive amounts of time, nor are they vessels that can manoeuvre or just journey along at any significant speed when they're underwater. So you could make the transit through the Bay of Biscay submerged and pop up occasionally for recharging, but it's going to take you forever to get out into the operational area, which is going to eat into your supplies. Alternatively, you could try and run the whole thing via snorkel, which occasionally would be tried, but that is only operable in certain types of weather. You're still relatively near the surface, and as it turned out later on, you could still be spotted by radar. So, given that even if they're running by snorkel because of the hull form of most submarines, they're still going to be slower underwater, it seemed to make the most sense to just run headlong on the surface as quickly as possible to get through the area and into your operational zones. The problem with that, of course, was that you could be picked off. Now, they did try and look at a number of ways. I say the snorkel was one of them. Later on, they tried the flak U-boats or U-flaks uh, for a while, and that didn't work out tremendously well in the end, apart from some initial surprise value. But simply put, it's down to the operational restrictions of World War II era submarines, and there's not a lot they can do to overcome it. They did try to address some of those issues. They knew, for example, that being hunted from the air with radar was a problem, so that was one of the many reasons why they went for the snorkel. But for a fair amount of time, they didn't think that radar was fine-detailed enough 
for air to air search radar or air to surface radar to find initially the subs or and later on things like periscopes and snorkels and that was based on their understanding of the radar tech it was the shorter wavelength allied radar that allowed the latter to be picked up and the allies were rightly quite worried about the possibility of the germans acquiring it and realizing what was going on so they developed all sorts of interesting things to try and ensure that if a ship if or if a u-boat was attacked by radar using the new um, cavity magnetron style radars that it would be the last thing the u-boat saw so that they couldn't report that hey the allies have developed a way of spotting us even in conditions where we thought we couldn't be spotted so it was a constant back and forth but one of the overriding things was simply just they need to get out to their operational area without burning through all of their supplies and that physically couldn't be done for the majority of the war by the majority of u-boats without significant time running on the surface and every time the germans came up with some kind of counter to minimize their losses it wasn't too long before the allies developed some new technology or technique that increased their losses again sean lynch asks why would a monarch knight a subject aboard their vessel say with francis drake and how common a practice was this now in this particular area i don't actually know the answer definitively um, i can put together a theory um, based on what i do know and what i've been able to research but or if anyone else has done more extensive research into this particular field and knows a more detailed answer in the comments below, please let us know. Anyway, with that caveat in place, the knighting of somebody aboard their ship does not appear to be a particularly common practice. And with Francis Drake's knighthood in particular, and perhaps I would suspect if it was done else in elsewhere other times, probably for the same reasons potentially one of the traditions i guess that you could look back to was the in the medieval period which is a period i do know a little bit more about um when it comes to this kind of stuff it was sometimes common practice to knight people before the battle so on the field of battle or what was about to become the field of battle you might create a bunch of new knights alternatively or perhaps in addition if someone had particularly have really distinguished themselves on the field of battle and this is obviously in the medieval times there were heralds on the sides keeping an eye on things and monitoring it all but if there were knights or the people who weren't actually knights at that point but men soldiers who had distinguished themselves with great great acts of heroism and courage and chivalry then they might be knighted upon the battlefield at the end of the battle by the monarch in question so there was a, there was a certain association you could obviously be you could inherit the title you might be knighted more conventionally etc but there does seem to have been a certain amount of at least for if you like battlefield promotions almost of associating someone's knighthood with the acts that they were about to undertake or had just undertaken where possible where this was kind of a knighthood earned on merit now with that said and bearing that obviously that's a, a more of a medieval thing it's entirely possible that with sir francis drake considering just how much he'd done in terms of exploration in terms of looting stuff off of the spanish and generally causing havoc for the queen's enemies and of course making sure the queen got a fairly big paycheck at the end of it all this may have been a kind of a, a hearkening back to that tradition i.e the golden hind was the ship upon which or if you like the field of battle upon which albeit mobile that francis drake had accomplished all of these things and therefore he was being knighted kind of on the battlefield for services rendered on that battlefield even if that battlefield happened to be a ship that would be my working theory at least Nick Boy 302 asks, Japanese negligence of convoy escort is well established, but th did this neglect extend to other areas of naval warfare not directly related to fleet action? For example, mine warfare, amphibious operations, resupply, fleet replenishment, etc. Uh, 
So the Japanese were actually fairly far ahead in a number of fields. Uh, granted, it was the Japanese army, but they had probably the world's most innovative amphibious um, assault force at the start of the war. So here's Shinsu Maru, and you can look up Ikitsu Maru and various other ships. The Japanese kind of pioneered the idea of what we would today recognize as the amphibious assault transport or possibly the LPD. Um, so they were certainly ahead in that field, um, at, as at least at first. In terms of resupply and replenishment, they actually had, again, had a fairly advanced understanding of this. When you look at um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, for example, that wasn't a we're going all the way from Japan to Pearl Harbor and back again on one tank. There were extensive, and in the case of some of the escorts, numerous refuelings at sea in 1941 by the Japanese fleet. They had a fairly good idea about how to do this. Um, quite possibly actually well ahead of any of the Allies, including the US Navy. Although, again, techniques were um, that the Allies had invented and adapted gradually overhauled Japanese expertise as the war went on. As far as mine warfare is concerned, the Japanese did have a reasonably sized but relatively small force of minesweepers they were planning on massively building that up in uh, the run-up to world war ii but they didn't get around to actually doing so entirely before the second world war broke out so again they had a relatively decent understanding of mind warfare technology one of the key things when it comes to Japanese tactics and technology is, although they advance, don't get me wrong, they do advance during the war, and they come up with some very clever and nifty ways of uh, getting around uh, various allied technologies, including things where the Allies have massive advantages over them in. But in a fair number of areas, whilst the Japanese start off with actually a reasonable lead, in a lot of areas of naval warfare, except for obviously some things they've really not paid much attention to, like convoy escort work. Um, what tends to happen is they don't quite stagnate, but they don't change as much as the Allies do. Um, so you look at like the Kantai Kessen Doctrine, the decisive battle. Sure, everyone has some idea that maybe this is a, a possibility at the start of World War Two, but by 1944 <laughs> the Japanese are still looking for the decisive battle the Allies have long ago moved past that albeit they have the material advantage to be able to do that apart from anything else um, but yes it's it's one of those things where if you look at the state the very badly beaten up and resource deprived state of the Japanese Navy in 1945 on the surface you would it would be very easy to conclude that this force, which is now a couple of years behind Allied technology, really has neglected everything. And that's not actually the case. It's more a case of the Allies have, in many fields, started out at a disadvantage, pulled level, and then overtaken in a fairly short amount of time, which is a, obviously a, that's a good credit to the Allies, considering they only had three or four years really to do that in. But that doesn't mean the Japanese were miles behind back at the start of the war. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. Only one bit of channel admin this week, and it's not 100% relevant to the channel particularly, unless you count you know, maybe coming and poking me with a stick as channel relevant. Um, but I will be at the Chalk Valley um, History Festival later this year yeah that's uh, if you're in the uk of course uh, which is a living history festival where unsurprisingly i will be there along with my medieval reenactment group and we'll be doing 14th century medieval reenactment but if you uh well if, if you want to take an opportunity to come and uh, say hello or poke me with a sharp pointy metal stick or something similar or watch me alternative alternately beat someone else over the head with a uh, metal blunt sword or possibly be beaten with a metal blunt sword or poleaxe or falchion or shield or whatever um if you think that might be highly amusing then well chalk valley uh history festival coming up later this year is where you will get to see that happen <laughs>
Okay, thanks very much and uh, see you again in another video.